Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. I'm John Lorden. I originally had a different episode scheduled for release today, a case that I was calling a motiveless murder, where a woman was killed with a hammer. In truth, the murder wasn't quite motiveless. It was a robbery attempt where the burglar wasn't expecting anyone to be at home. And when he did find someone there, he says he just freaked out and wound up murdering a poor woman. I'll release that one next week because this past week, Fort Hood is trying to convince us that in Vanessa Guillen's story, we're also looking at a motiveless murder, also conducted with a hammer. And just like in the original story I was going to release this week, the truth is there's always a motive. I want to thank a brain scratcher for sending me the affidavit for Cecily Ann Aguilar. It lays out enough of the investigation for me to think this case is completely solved with the exception of one question, why? Let's see if we could figure this out together by reviewing the investigation notes of Jonathan Varga, special agent with the FBI. He's worked with the FBI for over 16 years and is currently assigned to the Violent Crime Squad. He also works cases that happen on Fort Hood. The investigation started on April 23rd when Vanessa was reported missing. A witness told investigators that she left the arms room she was working in to visit another arms room being controlled by specialist Aaron Robinson. It said that they were confirming serial numbers for weapons and equipment. That same witness confirms that Vanessa did leave her ID, bank card, and car keys in her armory and that the stuff was still there when they left for the day and secured the room. Her last text message was sent to Specialist Robinson. I've heard in previous reports that it was a serial number. Agent Varga reports that Specialist Robinson was the last person known to have seen Vanessa. His story is that they worked together for a bit, he gave her a gun that needed to be serviced, and she left. He believed she was headed to the motor pool to give them some paperwork. People at the motor pool said she never arrived. Robinson said that after work on the day that Vanessa disappeared, he went home to his off-post residence that he shares with his girlfriend, Cecily Aguilar, and he was there for the rest of the night, except for a quick trip he made at 6.30 p.m. to use a government computer to enroll in some training. I'm curious about those computer records. I wonder if they'll find that he was actually using the government computer for something else, but we don't have information on that. Two witnesses say that they saw Robinson moving a tough box. I think this is the Pelican box that we were talking about on last week's Brain Scratch. Uh, this box had wheels on it and he was moving it to his vehicle. He loaded it into his car and then drove away. Other reports I've seen state that this might have happened around 8.30 p.m., but this specific report doesn't state the time. Since Robinson was at home with Aguilar, Agent Varga was curious about their cell phone activity. For some reason, their phones were calling each other throughout that night, as late as 3.30 a.m. When the girlfriend, Aguilar, was interviewed on June 19th, she told the same story, saying, yeah, they were home all night. When asked about the phone calls, she said that she had lost her phone and Robinson was calling it to try to help find it. There's a problem with that story, though because the talk times when the calls were connected with each other were far too long for that to make sense. She was interviewed again and said she lied about her previous statement. Her story was now that she likes to take long drives to cope, and her and Robinson took a long drive together that night to Belton to look at the stars. And then they returned home. Belton is the area where the remains were eventually found. And the investigators traced the location of Robinson's phone and confirmed that it was indeed in that area around 2 a.m. that night. Aguilar's phone shows that it was also in that area on April 23rd and again on the 26th. Now, just as an aside to everything, I think personally that the phone calls happening between their phones throughout that night might mean they were at different locations, possibly while uh, the remains were being burnt or something like that. It could be that the girlfriend was sent as a lookout somewhere and they were calling back and forth, but that's just personally what, what I think about the phone calls happening back and forth. The, the information in the affidavit really doesn't specify what they think is going on with those phone calls. But the location data did lead to searches in that area. At that time, they did find what they thought was a burn site and they found part of the burned tough Pelican box. 
They did notice a smell at that time, but they couldn't find remains. Nine days later, contractors that were working on a fence called in that they discovered what appeared to be human remains. When they searched there again, they found scattered remains in a concrete-like substance. Aguilar was interviewed again, and we get another news story from her. She now told them that Robinson told her he had struck a female soldier in the head with a hammer multiple times at his arms room, killing her on Fort Hood. He told Aguilar that Vanessa was placed in a box and moved to the Leon River. Aguilar said that Robinson picked her up from a gas station that she works at and took her to the Leon River. The box was already there. He opened it and showed her Vanessa's remains. The two of them then dismembered Vanessa's body and tried to burn it. The burning was unsuccessful. They placed the remains in three separate holes and covered them up. Now, if all that wasn't terrible enough, they returned to the site on April 26th with concrete purchased by Aguilar over Facebook Messenger. They uncovered the remains, removed them, continued breaking them down, tried burning them again, and then put the remains back into the three holes, this time topping them off with concrete. Aguilar said that when they got home, they burned the clothes that both of them were wearing. On June 30th, at the request of law enforcement, Aguilar placed a controlled telephone call to her boyfriend. Uh, I believe essentially that's where they've got law enforcement listening in, they're recording the call. He didn't deny anything that she said that they did to Vanessa over that specific call. Uh, he then later texted her pictures, pictures of news articles talking about the discovery of Vanessa's remains and on another controlled call with Aguilar said, quote, baby, they found pieces. They found pieces. Aguilar helped law enforcement track Robinson down when he fled the base. And when he was approached, of course, you know, he pulled out a gun and ended his own life. The report also states that the identification of Vanessa's remains are still pending. Now, admittedly, a lot of what I just shared with you is Cecily Aguilar's information, but the pieces are certainly fitting together. And I think this is likely very close to the truth of what happened. She's facing charges for mutilation and helping to conceal Vanessa's body. The three things that we hear from true crime experts time and time again are motivations for murder are love, money, or power. And it makes sense. In some way, all of us are motivated by one or more of these categories in almost just about everything that we do. When we apply these categories to the story of a soldier being murdered by a fellow soldier, well, I'm not sure that money seems like a strong candidate. I mean, admittedly, it's possible there was some financial arrangement that got out of hand, but I'm thinking it's probably not the case here. So we're really left with love or power. Now, what we're being told by Fort Hood officials time and time again is their investigation is not showing any sexual harassment going on. As a matter of fact, in their press conference on the case last week, it seems that something introduced initially as a quick side note takes the focus of the rest of the conference. The thorough investigation into sexual harassment will continue until it's complete and ready for the command's review. A as an aside, the criminal investigation has not found any connection between sexual harassment and Vanessa's disappearance. There's also been a widespread allegation that Specialist Robinson was the su superior of Specialist Guillen. This is false. Robinson was an armor who worked in a building adjacent to the building where PFC, cor correction, Specialist Guillen worked, and he was in no way Specialist Guillen chain, in, chain, in her chain of command. We are still investigating their interactions, but at this time there is no credible information or reports that Specialist Robinson sexually harassed Specialist Guillen. We also want to be very clear, we have no credible information or reports that Vanessa Guillen was sexually assaulted. We, were, we are not aware of any official reports of sexual harassment Specialist Guillen or any other soldier on her behalf when this important issue was first raised by the family. The Guillen family had, had made statements to the media concerning sexual harassment allegations, but again, we had no further information at this time of that claim. During the course of the investigation and 
and to the disappearance of specialist DNC IDH agents undercovered a statement on May 7th that could be considered potential sexual harassment. After subsequent investigation, another allegation of verbal harassment involved in the same individual was discovered. However, subsequent interviews has failed to corroborate this allegation. Nevertheless, we are still investigating. Specialist Robinson was not involved in these allegations. There has been no information, and we've interviewed uh, hundreds of people to include all acquaintances and, and, and co-workers of, of Ms. Guillen. So there's no allegation whatsoever that she's been sexually ass assaulted or harassed. And any hint of information that, that was sexual harassment was completely looked at without any credible information. Each allegation of sexual assault or sexual harassment is fully investigated, regardless of the source or what it's related to, whether it's tied to Specialist Guillen's disappearance or not. Because our credibility on this area is so important is why I've asked for an external review to come in and do it. What matters most to the command here at Fort Hood is we have the best environment for soldiers to train and perform their duties. We take those allegations and all allegations seriously and we're gonna pursue them to our fullest extent. It's not acceptable. They also seem extremely focused on the fact that Vanessa Guillen was not in her attacker's chain of command. I guess you don't have to pay attention to rank if you're not in the same unit. Does that sound right? Even if there is no direct correspondence to rank, does that exclude the, any possibility of sexual harassment? Doesn't sexual harassment have to happen with a superior where if you don't comply, your job is at risk? No, no, it doesn't, Fort Hood. And the fact that they keep trotting this out as if it's an excuse really scares me about what else is going on there. The United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC, certainly covers harassment by superior as one of the conditions, but that's not all that they use to define sexual harassment. There is another clause that we may have happening in this specific case. It states that such conduct has the purpose or effect of unreasonably interfering with an individual's work performance or creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment. Could that apply here based on the story that we're hearing from Vanessa's family? Absolutely. But Fort Hood wants to keep saying they've conducted an investigation on those allegations. The allegations that he walked into her shower and they can't find any information to support it. Well, let's be honest. The two people that you could ask about that are now dead. Your investigation on it started when the victim of the harassment was already missing. And you have enough information in Agent Varga's notes to easily confirm that Robinson was lying to you about what happened to Vanessa. So even if you question him when you finally kicked off your investigation, did you expect him to tell you the truth? Did you expect to find proof of what happened between two people in a shower? I'll never forget something that Dr. Laura Petler told me. Murder is conflict resolution for the murderer. So what was the conflict? Two co-workers not getting along, would that really warrant this? When you think about a woman deciding to help her boyfriend cover up a murder by mutilating a body not once but twice, don't you think there's some powerful emotional component at play for both of them? In my eyes, after reviewing hundreds of homicides over the years, this isn't a case about money. It's probably not a case about power. The actions taken to conceal the death make it appear to me this case has to do with passion, something that wouldn't only motivate Robinson to do this terrible crime, but something strong enough to motivate his girlfriend to join him in it. Something so terrible that from his perspective, he could never even justify it to himself. He instead ended his own life. When it comes to Fort Hood, what really scares me is more than just their antique and misunderstood perspective on what sexual harassment is. I'm now constantly hearing about other things happening there, stuff that isn't getting any press. It's seemingly unending. Soldiers, family members, friends, all with different stories that all seem to have the same ending. The Army used to use a slogan, Army of One and they scrapped it after using it after only five years because they wanted to focus more on teamwork. For many of the stories that people are telling me, that's the truth happening at Fort Hood. 
People that need and ask for help will find themselves an army of one, alone, ostracized, and maybe in some cases, even dead. Is there a reason that Fort Hood wants to steer this story away from the conclusion of sexual harassment? Possibly. The Military Times reported in 2019 that the Defense Department is looking to make sexual harassment a criminal offense. And they're doing that because these cases appear to be increasing among service members. A report from the department's Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office shows the number of reported cases of sexual assault in the ranks rose from nearly 4,800 in 2016 to more than 6,050 in 2018. And that's only the reported cases. There are likely far more instances of this going on that are unreported. Officials estimate the actual number of assaults in the military for fiscal 2018 at about 20,500 cases, a rise of nearly 38% over the previous two years. The report also states, quote, within the female active force, increases were concentrated among service women ages 17 to 24. Most perpetrators were in the E3 to E5 rank, and allegedly perpetrators were often the same grade or slightly higher than the victim. Does any of that sound familiar to you guys? I believe Robinson was actually an E4, and before her recent promotion, Vanessa was an E3 and 20 years old. And I'll leave you with, with this. That recent promotion that Vanessa got to specialist that happened on July 1st, now that you know the time frame of the investigation, the rank of the man that murdered her, the recent focus by the Defense Department to criminalize sexual harassment, was that promotion really to honor Vanessa, or was it so that when people read about this case years down the road, history shows that the killer and the victim were actually the same rank? Totally not sexual harassment, right? Look, guys, I respect what our military does for us, but I don't have a lot of respect for any administration who will set self-preservation as a more important focus than the humanity of its members. Of those three main motivators that we talked about today that are the usual push for murder, money, power, or love, what do you think is the motivating factor driving Fort Hood? In terms of Vanessa Guillen, I consider this case cracked. And for her friends and family, our hearts are cracked too. Thank you for caring so much about this case. And thank you to everyone that's been helping me come to a better understanding of, of all this. You are all heroes in my book. I'll see you again on the Lord and Arts channel.